Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's event. My name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. I'm a professor in political science and a concurrent professor in the law school, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this afternoon's event. Uh, let me just say a few words about the center. Uh, we foster teaching and research on the fundamental questions of constitutional government with a focus on natural rights and the American Constitution. Um, we do all sorts of activities. We do lectures like this one. Uh, we have an undergraduate minor, for so uh, you undergraduates in the audience, if you're interested in studying constitutionalism, please come talk to me. And then we have a fellowship program. This is a smaller program for undergraduates, uh, about two dozen undergraduates, and they do things like meet with our guest speakers. Uh, so we had a seminar with Judge Duncan with our undergraduate fellows uh, this morning. So if you're interested in getting more involved with the center, please uh, con uh, contact me. Um, or find me after today's event. Uh, you can find out about all of our events on our website, um, constudies.nd.edu. Um, you know, the, the importance of today's event, I think, really needs uh, no explanation. What, ha what happened two weeks ago at Stanford Law School raises fundamental questions about free speech and our liberal democracy and how healthy our free speech culture is, uh, even if our free speech culture is understood uh, especially at our nation's elite schools. Um, at the center, we've been doing a series of events on free speech over the last few years um, from perspectives on both sides of the aisle. If you go to our website, you'll see lectures by uh, Nadine Strassen, the former head of the ACLU, from Bill Galston, former uh, Clinton official, uh, now at the Wall Street Journal, from Ross Douthat on the New York Times, uh, from Keith Whittington, an endowed chair at Princeton University, all on the theme of free speech and its importance. Um, it's a, a, a theme of central importance to the university. Uh, and what we're doing today, I think, is especially important. Um, we're going to address the question at hand as a university should by engaging in reasoned and respectful dialogue. That means uh, listening as well as speaking. Um, I'm sure we won't have a problem here. Um, but when you interrupt people, you not only show offense to the speaker, you show disrespect to those who have a right to hear the speaker. Uh, Notre Dame is especially good at uh, doing free speech. I'm proud of what we do here at Notre Dame. I'm proud to say that Judge Duncan accepted our invitation in part because of our track record. Um, free speech also includes uh, the exchange of ideas. So of course, as we do always, there will be a period for question and answers. Um, for those in the room, if you can ask your questions via the QR code, which I will then receive and then ask, you don't have to put your name, but I'd appreciate it if you put your name and your affili affiliation so I can recognize you when I'm asking your question. Uh, I should welcome our online audience. We're live streaming to, across the world. And part of that live stream audience is, I'm pr proud to say, is the Stanford FedSoc chapter. So for, for you kids from Stanford. Now they're on spring break, so I hope they're watching. Um, a few announcements. Uh, today's actually just the first of two big events we're hosting at 5 o'clock tonight in the um, Mendoza Business School um, in the auditorium there. We're hosting a debate. Uh, this should be great. It's, uh, the debate resolution is uh, how, how moral are markets? Uh, two phenomenal speakers, Jim Otteson, who's an endowed chair at the business school. Uh, I think he's on the pro-moral side. And then um, Michael Anton, former Trump official, will be uh, speaking, I guess, about some reservations up about markets. It's at five o'clock. You're all welcome. It will also be live streamed. It's a Lincoln Douglas style debate. So we'll have um, one side go, then the other, and then the other side respond. It should be quite good. So I encourage you to come uh, to that tonight. Uh, a few thank yous. Uh, first to Dean Reuter and the National Office of the Federal Society uh, for their support of today's event. It's being co-sponsored by the FedSox National Office, their Freedom of Thought project. I uh, also want to thank uh, Notre Dame's chapter of the Federalist Society for co-sponsoring today's event. And then a few uh, very important thank yous uh, to my staff. Um, Soren Greffenstadt, Mary Frances Myler, Debbie O'Malley, Zane Marbury. Um, they were all here very early this morning. They won't go home till well past 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, they've been working very hard. Um, and so I'm very thankful. Um, I'm just a pretty face. They do all the work. Um, so thank you uh, to the staff. 
Okay, we have a, we have a tradition here at the center. We, have, uh, we try to put students front and center of everything we do, and that includes introducing our speakers. So I'm uh, pleased to introduce Olivia Rogers. Olivia is a 3L at uh, Notre Dame Law School. She's president of the Federal Society chapter here at Notre Dame, and she'll in introduce Judge Duncan. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Judge Duncan received his undergraduate degree from Louisiana State University and graduated with his JD also from Louisiana State University. Before becoming a judge, he had a fascinating career, first as appellate chief for Louisiana Attorney General's Office, then as general counsel of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. He founded a law firm in Washington, D.C. called Cher Duncan, now Cher Jaffe, where he, uh, and he was then appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in May of 2018. We're so excited for Judge Duncan to speak today about free speech and legal education in our liberal democracy. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's, uh, it's so good to be with you today. Um, as a Catholic, I am honored to be speaking in a university that's specially dedicated to Our Lady. Uh, I am grateful to Professor Philip Munoz and to the Notre Dame Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government for inviting me. Uh, I'm grateful to the Federal Society, both the local and the national chapters, for, uh, for co-sponsoring my visit. <laughs> Take two. Now, Professor Munoz promised I wouldn't be silenced during this talk. <laughs> it is so good to be with you today. As a Catholic, I am honored to be speaking at a university specially dedicated to Our Lady. I am grateful to Professor Munoz and the Notre Dame Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government for inviting me and to the Federalist Society for co-sponsoring my visit. I've given plenty of talks at schools, law schools, and other schools over the years, but never one quite like this. This is a talk about another talk. A couple of weeks ago on March 9th, I was invited by the Stanford Federalist Society to deliver a lecture at Stanford Law School, but it was cut short by a student protest. Soon after, Professor Munoz graciously reached out and offered me a chance to give some reflections on what happened. I gladly accepted even though I don't particularly enjoy talking about myself. By and large, federal judges are a reclusive bunch. We usually talk through our opinions or about our opinions, but this was an unusual event and it involves me, although heaven knows I wish it didn't. And so here I am. I hope you can get something out of it. I want to reflect on the event at Stanford from three related angles, free speech, legal education, and how we govern ourselves in this country. While I was preparing these remarks, something else remarkable happened. Just last Wednesday, March 22nd, the Stanford Law School Dean, Jenny Martinez, sent an extraordinary letter to the Stanford community. It is a powerful letter and it is a credit to Dean Martinez. The letter happens to touch in an eloquent way on some of the same themes I'm talking about today. So I will highlight parts of the Dean's letter, which. which is available online if you care to read it. I encourage you to read it. At the outset, let me say that I believe that the letter and the sentiments that the dean articulates so well provide a solid basis for improving the intellectual climate uh, at Stanford and perhaps at other law schools, assuming that its powerful words are backed by concrete actions. Now, I prefer not to recount the details of what happened on March 9th. Uh, I've done that elsewhere, and you can read it, uh, or if you want, you can watch the video or listen to the audio. Suffice it to say that it was a disgrace. I truly hope that what happened on that day does not reflect the cast of mind of most of the students, faculty, or administration at Stanford or at any other law school. And yet, Stanford is one of the elites, and so I think it's fair to reflect on the event in a larger way at the very least to underscore what went wrong and what we all hope will not happen again. So what about free speech? 
We have, as you know, a vital tradition of free speech in this country, both in our law and in our culture. That, of course, extends to student protests. Think of the students who refuse to pledge allegiance to the flag in the Barnett case. Think of the students who protested the Vietnam War by wearing black armbands in the Tinker case. The students at Stanford enjoy the same right to protest me. It's a great country where you can harshly criticize federal judges and nothing bad will happen to you. You might even get praised or promoted. The students there can protest me every day of the week if they want and twice on Sunday. The students at Stanford and other elite law schools swim in an ocean of free speech. Has any group of people ever been so free to speak in the history of our nation or any nation? Has any group ever been so privileged? In the aftermath of the event, a large number of students protested the dean herself in her own class for the offense of having apologized to the likes of me. But make no, make no mistake, what went on in that classroom on March the 9th had nothing to do with our proud American tradition of free speech. It was rather a parody of it. I'm relieved that Dean Martinez's letter forcefully recognizes this. As she writes, quote, freedom of speech does not protect a right to shout down others so they cannot be heard. It is not free speech to silence others because you hate them. It is not free speech to jeer and heckle a speaker who's been invited to your school so that he can't deliver a talk. It is not free speech to form a mob and hurl taunts and threats that aren't worthy of being written on the wall of a public toilet. It is not free speech to pretend to be harmed by words or ideas you disagree with, and then use that feigned harm as a license to deny a speaker the most rudimentary forms of civility. Some of the students were apparently convinced that what they were doing was, quote, counter speech, wrong. Counter speech means offering a reasoned response to an argument. It doesn't mean screaming, shut up, you scum, we hate you, at a distance of 12 feet. Other students claimed this was nothing more than the, quote, marketplace of ideas in action. Again, wrong. The marketplace of ideas describes a free and fair competition among opposing arguments with the most compelling one we hope emerging on the top. What transpired at Stanford was no marketplace. It was more like a flash mob on a shoplifting spree. One final note on free speech. Do not think for a moment that the mob showed up to respond to my talk or to engage in some high-minded back and forth about what I was invited to Stanford to talk about, which was, not incidentally, simply decisions from my court where my court has to engage with the Supreme Court in an areas of doctrinal flux, when it's not clear what the law is. And I was going to highlight some of our decisions where we do that. Some of those decisions may be correct. Some of those decisions may be wrong. Some of those decisions will probably be reviewed by the Supreme Court. If they had wanted to do a back and forth with me, that would of course been fine. But the mob had no interest in my talk at all. They were there to heckle and to jeer and to shame. If you doubt that, just listen to what they said. At one point, the ringleader, a young woman clearly visible on the video, asked the crowd to, quote, tone down the heckling slightly so we can get to the Q&A. That's right. Let's have the optimal level of heckling so we can get to the good part where we hurl questions at the judge like, quote, how do you feel about all the people your opinions have killed? Let's say the quiet part out loud. The mob came to target me because they hate my work and my ideas. They hate the clients that I represented in court when I was a lawyer. They hate the arguments that I made in court to represent those clients. They evidently hate my judicial opinions, although the protesters were evidently familiar with only one of the hundreds that I've written, an opinion where I refuse to enlist the federal judiciary in the project of controlling what pronouns people use. 
So the protesters did not come to respond to my talk or engage in counter speech. They just wanted to vent. None of this spectacle, this obviously staged public shaming, had the slightest thing to do with free speech. It had everything to do with intimidation. With intimidation. And to be clear, not intimidating me. I'm not intimidated by any of this. I'm a life tenured judge. I'm going to go back to my court and keep writing opinions. No, the target of the intimidation was the protesters' fellow students. The message could not have been clearer. Woe to you if you represent the kind of clients that Judge Duncan represented, or you take the same views that he has. So next, let's talk about legal education. We shouldn't forget that this incident did not occur in a campus bar at 12.45 a.m. after the USC game. It occurred in a law school, indeed one of our nation's elite law schools. Dean Martinez's letter eloquently explained why this makes the incident doubly shameful. Start with the fact that Stanford is a university. As the dean explains, quote, a university must sustain an extraordinary environment of freedom of inquiry and maintain an independence from political fashions, passions, and pressures, end quote. Now, why is that? Well, it's because of the university's mission, which, as she writes, is, quote, the discovery, improvement, and dissemination of knowledge. This search for knowledge, for truth, can, quote, challenge social values. It can create discontent with existing social arrangements. And it can sometimes be, like Socrates, upsetting. The antithesis of this open, curious, and challenging search for knowledge is, the dean writes, quote, an echo chamber. All of this is true, and it's admirable for the dean to say it so plainly. Yet, what greeted me in that classroom on March the 9th was, in fact, the echo chamber that the dean warns us about. What was most obvious was that the students were so threatened by the mere presence of someone whose views may challenge their own orthodoxy, that their only response was to cover their ears by jeering and yelling. Now add to this one more thing. This was not only a university, but a law school. As Dean Martinez explains, the students there are being trained, quote, to make arguments on behalf of clients whose very lives may depend on their professional skill. The students must therefore learn to, quote, confront injustice or views they don't agree with and respond as attorneys. That is all exactly right. But unfortunately, the temperament and cast of mind necessary to function as lawyers was not in evidence that day. I remember when I was in law school, not a school as exalted as Stanford. From the very first day, I was keenly aware of all that I did not know. And then even my very patterns of thought needed to be strengthened and refined. I was, after all, an English lit major. And yet, what I was led to discover by my professors was that argument, calm, reasoned, persistent, and logical argument were the keys to persuasion. By contrast, brood appeals to anger, to passion, to grievance, ad hominem attacks, histrionics, would not only fail to persuade, but would cripple one's credibility as an advocate. Naturally, I did not always agree with my professors, but I respected them. I listened to them, and I learned from them what it meant to be a lawyer. I also remember being visited at the law school by at least two Supreme Court justices, Justice Kennedy and Justice Ginsburg. I got to have dinner with them. It impressed me profoundly that they were willing to take time to interact with students like me at the Paul M. Hebert Law Center at Louisiana State University. We didn't even have a law school. We had a law center, we like to say. Perhaps I disagreed with some of their opinions I had read in class. But the idea of shouting them down never remotely occurred to me. It would have been abhorrent. What shame that would have brought on me on my school, my professors, and my fellow students. Dee Martinez is correct when she writes, quote, I believe 
we cannot function as a law school from the premise that appears to have animated the disruption of Judge Duncan's remarks, end quote. And what was that premise? Well, she tells us that speakers, texts, or ideas believed by some to be harmful inflict a new impermissible harm justifying a heckler's veto simply because they are present on this campus. I've heard someone comment recently that to be a lawyer, by definition, means that you have to occupy the same room with people you seriously disagree with. And yet, you then have to engage in reasoned, indeed persuasive argument with them. I have argued high, high profile cases in some of the highest courts of the land on issues that royal our society against friends of mine on the other side. And afterwards, we shook hands and we said, who do you think is going to win that one? And we remained friends. You have to learn that kind of behavior. Uh, that just doesn't come naturally. If all of what Dean Martinez says about the cast of mind of lawyers and legal education is true, and it is, then the primitive impulse to shout someone down is not a trait we should want to encourage in law schools, obviously. Just the opposite. It is a trait that we should strive to help students unlearn. Finally, we must not overlook why we train lawyers. It is to make our civil society, our liberal democracy, function correctly. Once again, Dean Martinez says this well, quote, law is a mediating device for difference. The discourse of law and of lawyers greatly affects how we order our lives together in a liberal democracy. I am no political philosopher, heaven knows, and Professor Munoz would have much more to say about this than I. But one thing strikes me. The basic premise of a free and self-governing society is that we as citizens can reason together. This occurs not only in government, but in the multitude of mediating institutions that constitute civil society. To accomplish this requires certain civic virtues, self-control, humility, tolerance, patience, moderation, courage, just to name a few. What would happen if the cast of mind modeled in that classroom at Stanford becomes the norm in legislatures, in courts, in universities, in boardrooms, in businesses, in churches. We must resist this at all costs. Otherwise, we will cease to have a rule of law. Lawyers and the schools that educate them have immense responsibilities in this regard. So I am cautiously encouraged that Stanford has promised to implement some form of training for students in the virtues of civil discourse. I hope it is only the beginning. In closing, I would like to do something that I haven't had the chance to do since the May 9th event, and that is publicly thank the Stanford Federalist Society for inviting me to speak. Even though the talk didn't go as planned, I owe each of you a debt of gratitude. As I was trying to say that day, I know that you would never treat your fellow students as you were treated, no matter how much you may disagree with them or with speakers they might invite to campus. I was encouraged to read this, in Dean Martinez's letter, quote, the Federalist Society has the same rights of free association that other student organizations at the law school have. I encourage you to take the dean at her word. Consider also these words from her letter, quote, we support diversity, equity, and inclusion when we encourage people in our community to reconsider their own assumptions and potential biases. I submit that students like you, who might find themselves out of the mainstream in certain quarters, you have an important role to play in challenging your fellow students and professors to reconsider their own assumptions and potential biases across a whole range of supposed orthodoxies. There will always be people who want to tell you what to think, what to say, 
even what words you are allowed to use. But you are free to challenge the echo chamber with a firm, I respectfully disagree. Do not be afraid to do that. I am grateful for being able to speak to you today. Thank you. Okay, again, if you're here uh, in person, uh, please uh, use the QR code uh, to um, uh, ask your questions. Um, it's helpful to me, so I, we have a, a tradition here of uh, asking questions, ask, letting students ask the first question. So uh, if you put your name and your year, I can make sure to get to as many student questions as possible. Uh, so I'm going to read them, uh, these just about uh, verbatim to you. First question is from, from Sri uh, Thakar. I think he's a, a first-year student. Uh, he says, um, what do you think the limitations of free speech are? Um, for example, Notre Dame is a Catholic university. Are there certain viewpoints that uh, should be off limits here? That's a, you're, you're good. That's a great question. Um, the, uh, I encourage you to read Dean Martinez's letter, which I thought was profound. Um, she makes the point that there are different setting, in different settings, there are different rules for free speech. There, there's always free speech. There are very few fora where there's just no, where, where the, 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 the person who controls the form just controls what's said. Very, very seldom does that happen. But there are all sorts of settings for free speech. And she points out that a political rally in a park is gonna have different usages, different customs for free expression than th this event, than a, a, a debate on campus, than um, you know, a, a panel on environmental law. Right? There are always going to be different rules for different settings. And that's a well-recognized part of, uh, of the law of free expression. And by the way, I recognize that Stanford's a private university, of course. Right? And so it's not technically subject to the First Amendment, but Stanford has made itself subject, uh, as she explains, to norms of free expression. At a Catholic university like this, it, it's inconceivable that the Catholic identity of the university doesn't have some impact on what speakers are invited or what viewpoints are held out. And yet it is a university, right? It's a university. So that also implies a certain kind of free exchange of ideas, debate on matters uh, that, you know, uh, that, that someone may, may think, well, that's not Catholic orthodoxy. Okay, I get that. Um, so it's a university and it's Catholic. So that's a setting uh, that we have to take into account when we talk about the limits of free speech. But of course, what we're talking about here is not really, although, I mean, I've talked about free speech a lot. I think free speech is only tangentially related to what happened at Stanford because under no conceivable norm of free speech was that an exercise of free speech in an appropriate setting. I'll preface this uh, next question by saying you don't have to answer any questions you don't want to, but this is from Luke, uh, right. who's a senior here. Do you believe the Stanford law students um, should be disciplined, those who shut down your talk? Well, you're, you're, um, I'm not going to tell a private university what to do. Um, that, that, it's, that is up to them and to follow their own rules and their own norms. Um, I think it is clear from the dean's letter that what occurred there violated the norms of the school, at least by some of the students. Um, and I leave it up to Stanford to do what they think uh, is, is appropriate. And it's not for me to say. Uh, from Luke Thompson, who's a senior here at Notre Dame. Um, what do you tell an undergraduate considering law school who has decided, and this might be a personal question, who is deciding between Stanford Law School and Notre Dame? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, um, so I, I, I can't speak against my host, Notre Dame, although I will point out that we stole your football coach. Um, and, and, and I hope that works out for everybody. Uh, uh, it's worked out for us. It, it, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, um, I will say this, and I talked to some students at a, at a seminar before this, and this is, a, yeah, look, I mean, again, I, I usually tell people don't rely on me for career advice. Because I decided to go, I decided my English literature degree, my deep interest in uh, William Faulkner 
wasn't a marketable skill, at least at least at the undergraduate level. So I applied to law school late, and I applied to one school, and you know, and and so such is life. Um, I, I think the underlying premise of that question is: Should I avoid places where I think I'm not going to be welcome? Right, and it, certainly you should take into account whether you, with your own temperament, your own views, your own appetite for conflict, uh, your your own. Uh, your, your own desire to sort of refine your own abilities and views means you want to go to a place like, you know, a place where you will feel that you're out of the mainstream. Um, I got an LLM at Columbia, uh, for which I'm grateful, and I had a great time there. Uh, I, I don't think that I was in the mainstream in terms of, of the views on many subjects. I, I did, a, uh, I did a, a paper with a wonderful uh, First Amendment expert there uh, on uh, a legal history topic, and I could tell that he and I were not on the same page, uh, but that's fine. That that helped me understand myself better, helped me understand the limits of my arguments, helped me understand why I was right, and where I was wrong, and where I, my, I might be right. Um, if you you need to know yourself, and if you want to go and 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 you feel that that would be the right way, the right place for you to grow, I, I think you should do it. One thing I do think that we should avoid is segmenting ourselves into different. Uh, uh, into different sort of little little groups, little islands out there. Um, I don't think that's good for our society. It is certainly not good for uh, any law school to just sort of be this monoculture at this echo chamber where everybody thinks the same thing. Um, it, and and I'm, I'm sure that's true at Notre Dame as well. Um, and why? It's because in law school, you're supposed to learn respectful engagement with people who disagree with you. And why? It's because that's what you have to do as a lawyer. That's that's like, by definition, what you have to do as a lawyer. You can't say, ah, hey, I really like this law thing, but I just don't like arguing with people. <laughs> well, no, no, that's that that's not the way it is. Yeah, sure, you can be a transactional lawyer, but even then, <laughs> uh, you, nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> make a lot more money than I do. Um, uh, but even then, you have to learn how to engage with people who may disagree with you. Those people may be in your own law firm. Those people may be people that you're doing a deal with, and you have to understand how to get your point across in a respectful way. Lawyers have to be zealous advocates. And so there's the tension, I suppose. Um, uh, and I've, I've argued cases zealously for clients, clients that I may not agree with, by the way, um, but I've argued the case zealously but zealously doesn't mean yelling, right? Zealously does not mean um, insulting. Zealously means I'm going to use all the tools at my disposal to try to persuade the decision maker that my client is right. And that, that does require a lot of self-control. That, that doesn't require just knowing that you have to do that. That requires being socialized, if that's the right word, into, it's like being, being, being trained in, in, in something. You have to develop a habit of mind to do that. And some, you know, some people start out law school and they discover like me, well, you know, I, I just wanted to analyze this text, you know, like, like I did with Keats or something, right? Well, that's, there's more to law school than that. Uh, and it requires a development of a certain cast of mind. Um, and um, so I think I've walked my way all around that question without actually answering it. Um, this comes from Peter Alvaro. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Alvedo, a third-year law student, um, other judges have suggested boycotting hiring clerks from law schools that do not adequately support free speech. Uh, has your experience influenced your perspective on uh, that question? Well, I know this is talked about, and I have a lot of respect for the judges who take that position, um, and I understand why they're doing it. And I think that uh, what they are pointing towards, the, the, the goal that they're pointing towards would be the same goal that I would point towards when I say law schools, if they if they have this cultural problem, or this sort of problem of, a, of an intellectual climate that's a, that's not conducive to studying law, we, we need to do something about that. I, I don't. I, I think that the judges who are are, are are taking that step are very well intentioned, and I think that they are uh, they are aiming at the same goal that say the dean's letter is aiming at to improve the intellectual culture of, uh, of law schools. There are many different ways to do this. And I think, you know, I, I gotta tell you, I, I'm, I've have been 
no one is more surprised than I am at at the uh, at this event, um, not this event, but the other event, um, and 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 what the reaction to it has been, and how much it's been discussed already. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with me. I have I think it has to do something with uh, a, a culture of uh, in in law schools that I hope isn't particularly widespread, but I don't know. And so I think we have to wait and see what develops. Uh, I do think that law schools themselves have immense responsibility. Um, and I don't like to tell other people what to do. I mean, judges can do what they think is right. Uh, law schools can do what they think is right. Uh, law firms can express their views on these matters. After all, the law firms are the ones who are hiring the law students. Uh, you, you, law firms hire students Law students, not just because they're smart, not just because they're passionate about something, but because they have the skills to be good lawyers. And so I would think law firms in particular, who are the sort of a major consumer of the, the product of law schools, law, uh, young lawyers, have a real interest in making sure that what's being taught at law school is, is, is conducive to, to being an effective lawyer. I think there are lots of solutions here. A follow-up question, and this is right on the theme you're talking about. This is from Meg Lane. Uh, Lang, um, based on your previous experience, uh, especially at Stanford, I imagine, and then the reaction to it, do you think situations like the one that you were placed in at Stanford are going to be more likely or less likely to happen in the future? I have no idea. Um, I, I hope uh, I hope much, much less likely. Um, I, I, w I, one reason why I have been willing to speak about this in a limited way, um, because normally judges just don't speak about stuff, and I understand why. Um, but one reason why I have is because I was at the center of it and I feel like I'm in a position to say, well, look, this is how I perceived it. Uh, this is why I think it was inappropriate. Um, we have had some incidents like this at other schools that I think have motivated administrators to move in a positive direction. Uh, that's my hope. And so this one has attracted a lot of attention. And so I hope it is an encouragement to move in a positive direction. A positive direction means we don't see this anymore. It doesn't mean we don't we 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 won't see disagreement. It, it would be disturbing not to have disagreement. And on the very issues that those students were protesting me on, it would be disturbing to have disagreement. But what's disturb what's what is more disturbing is to see a monoculture that thinks only one thing, and thinks there's only one acceptable view, one acceptable thought. And, and is motivated by a desire to drive out people who don't conform to that orth orthodoxy. That is what I think is inappropriate. And, am I, this is my question. Am I right in understanding that you agree wholeheartedly with the deans in her, in her letter that uh, protest is fine, part of legal education, but disruption not? I mean, that was her distinction. Of course. Of course. That is, the, that is as I understood it before I went there, that is the basic policy. Uh, I think that there, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, you have to, you have to, it depends on how that cashes out in the details, it turns out. Um, and um, there, there, are, there, there are ways of protesting uh, a speaker that are appropriate and healthy um, and that uh, w don't bother me at all. Um, but oddly enough, um, I have spoken at many law schools. And I have never, I, I can't even remember being protested. Uh, certainly nothing like this, but I can't ever, I mean, maybe a flyer here and there. Oh, I don't like him. Okay. Um, but I just don't, I just don't remember that. That's why this has just sort of come out of nowhere. And, and I don't, it just was surprising. Okay. Uh, a question more on the law here. This is from uh, Stephen, a theology graduate student. Uh, as a Catholic judge, as a judge who is Catholic, <laughs> do you ever feel uh, moral dilemmas in upholding legal issues which may be constitution, sorry, which may be constitutional but not moral? For example, the re uh, religious liberty rights of a group that offered a black mass and makes a reference to Oklahoma City in 2016. Maybe that's mm. an actual case. I'm, I don't I'm not sure. But. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the law is pretty clear that if because of my religious commitments, I could not impartially decide a case according to the law, I would have to recuse. I mean that's 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 clear as a bell, uh, and I and and that's a that's a position that other judges and justices have quite publicly taken, and I think that's consistent with the code of judicial ethics. However, I would caution, merely because I'm a Catholic or you might be a, a Jew or a Muslim or an atheist or whatever, it's not appropriate to take that that religious commitment 
into account when saying you should be recused. That's not appropriate. And I'm, and you're not saying that, yeah. uh, but I'm just anticipating. Yeah. Uh, no, I was going to ask you, in, in practice, um, I mean, this issue comes up a lot when we're talking about judges, uh, especially here at Notre Dame. Um, but in practice, do judges recuse themselves because they don't, I, I don't know what the practice of judicial recusal is, because they feel like, like for whatever reason, my mm -hmm. commitments, my philosophy, my religion, I can't adequately ad or impartially address the case at hand. Does that happen on your circuit or on um, judges frequently? Uh, I haven't looked at it empirically. I certainly believe that it happens. It certainly can happen. Uh, there is a mechanism for that. A judge could, could as we say, sua sponte, just do that. Um, um, so it, it, it certainly can happen. I think it would be healthy. Um, I think it, it, to the extent that it does happen, I think that's a healthy part of our legal system. Um, I'll also say uh, parties can make motions to recuse judges. I have been... Uh, I've been the object of one of those, and I, I granted it because I, there was a voting rights case in my court, and I was on the panel, and it had been going on for years and years. The case had been going on for years and years, mm -hmm. and I completely forgotten that the law firm I used to be with had filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, at a much earlier stage uh, of that case. I totally forgot about it. Um, it wasn't on my sort of, it, the case was so old that it wasn't on my sort of automatic recusal list. And the parties filed this very vigorous motion, you must recuse. And I looked at it and I said, wow, you're right. And I recused. Um, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. This is from Madeline Stout, uh, junior here. You mentioned William Faulkner, and I couldn't help but think of the Nobel Prize banquet speech in 1950. I mean, me too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> of how men in how men and women have forgotten the problem of the human heart and its conflicts. Would your, would your diagnosis of free speech issues, would you diagnose free speech issues with a similar take that it's no longer a problem of the spirit, but of, but of fear? Um, and when, what sorts of education uh, could address this? Well, that's a deep question. That's, that's the one where he said, we, man will endure, is, is that right, I think? Maybe, I, I don't know. I think, he was, a, <laughs> He was, I used to teach at the University of Mississippi and Faulkner's house was not, not far. He was a, he was a complicated, complicated fellow, um, brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, I, that is a deep question. I, I think, wow, I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah, I, I mean, the answer, I think the answer is yes, that uh, there's all sorts, of, that's why I was talking about civic virtues earlier. In order to engage with your fellow citizens in a reasoned way, you have to have it, it takes work to do that. It's not just something that comes naturally to us. You have to work at that. You have to work to listen to somebody who you intensely disagree with. You have to work to understand the premises of their arguments. You have to be uh, self-critical enough to say, gosh, am I wrong about that? Um, we internally on our court, we do that all the time. There's a very, there's a, a, a vigorous back and forth among the judges on my court that we do largely written by written memoranda, uh, but but searching questions to other judges, I think you're wrong about this. Respectfully, you know, we sort of use the language of diplomacy, but it's pretty strong arguments. You know, re respectfully, I think this is you know completely wrong, and I I I I wish you would can reconsider this for the following reasons. And it takes work to like not get upset by that, to have sort of this detachment you know, this, this detachment from your own views. Um, and, and that's the legal education, the habituation, the training yeah, you're talking about. That's right. Being, learning how to do that. Yes, yeah. yes. You, 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 that doesn't come naturally to many people. So that's one way of answering Certainly it. Certainly not good academics, question. yeah. Um, boy, there's a lot of questions here. Let me try to find the student <clears throat> ones, I'm sorry. Water. Sure. Um, here's one about overturning precedent. Uh, mm -hmm. When is it legitimate to overturn Precedent, and let me, the question didn't ask this, but let me, I think this might actually tie into the talk you were going to give at Stanford. Mm -hmm. As a, uh, not a member of the Supreme Court, as an appellate judge, when is it, um, when, if ever, is it uh, permissible for you to overturn precedent? precedent? That's a great question. And that was, that was what I was going to talk about. Um, so keep in mind, the, the Constitution, in a rather insulting way, I might add, describes my court as an inferior court. <laughs> <clears throat> There's one judge in my court who remained nameless 
who says we should never refer to a district court as a lower court because we're all inferior courts. Um, as an inferior court, I am bound to follow the decisions of the Supreme Court. It's just that simple. I, I can't ignore them. I can't get around them. And I can't do what's called underruling them, meaning sort of reading them for less of a proposition than they actually stand for, or not as much of a proposition they stand for. So I'm bound by Supreme Court. Um, I'm also bound by other decisions of my court because a panel of three judges sits as a, dele as, a, as a delegee, I guess, a representative of the entire court. So I'm bound to follow our own decisions. Um, so we, it, it, within that realm though, especially in, in times of legal change, and we're in one of those times right now because of the changing membership of the Supreme Court, new doctrines come up, cases get overruled. Um, so uh, Second Amendment, for example, one of the cases I was going to talk about is a very difficult case from our court that deals with whether someone subject to a civil order of restraining them from committing domestic violence, a civil order, can, consistent with the Second Amendment, say, and you also cannot possess a gun. Very difficult question. Um, and it, it's difficult in and of itself but it's also even more difficult because the Supreme Court has recently altered the analysis that one is to use, that lower courts are to use, sorry, inferior courts, are to use for analyzing the Second Amendment. It requires a much more intense historical analysis of whether there are analogous laws in our tradition to that one, which is a federal law. So what do you do? Well, you, you do your best. You do a lot of work to figure out how best to apply the Supreme Court. Even more difficult, what if the Supreme Court doesn't have a precedent directly on point? So we have another case from our court on whether states can regulate the censor, can, well, I don't want to put it that way, can regulate what social media platforms do with respect to content. Someone against the social media platforms may say, can the social media platforms censorship of viewpoints be policed by the state? Somebody else might say, can social media platforms own free speech be controlled by the state? Two different sides of that question. There aren't Supreme Court precedents that directly speak to that. So you have a very lengthy uh, decision from our court that's very well done by Judge Oldham uh, that goes one way. And then you have a very lengthy decision from the 11th Circuit that goes in a, in a different way based on a Florida law. And by the way, those two judges were both appointed by President Trump. Okay. So it's not true, and I, I, I really push back against this, that, oh, all these, these judges appointed by that president, they all think the same way. Oh, no. No, no, no. We disagree fundamentally on certain things, um, and, and, and we do it vigorously, and we do it in public. And that's good. That's very good. It's, very, it's a very difficult question. What do you do? Well, you look at analogous precedents. You might look at a, a precedent about whether a law school can eject military rec recruiters from their premises because the law school doesn't like the military recruiters' policies with respect to some, something. Uh, or you can look at a precedent that says, um, can a newspaper be forced to include an editorial? Uh, uh, if you run an editorial in a campaign, can you be forced to include the other candidate's editorial? Miami Herald case. How do you apply those precedents to this very new realm of social media platforms? Are they like a newspaper? Are they like something else? Very difficult to do. Um, and I, I can tell you, I've read both of those opinions. They're very long. They're very sophisticated. They're very complex. And those judges, and I'll echo the, the, the Chief Justice of the United States here, those are not Trump judges. Those are judges who are doing their best to figure out the, the answer to difficult legal questions based on the precedents that we have. Um, and, and that's what's going on. I wish people knew that more, that it's not judges just sitting around going, I don't like Twitter. You know, that's not how it works. Uh, you, you actually have to follow precedents and rules and look at carefully at things. That's why I say it, the, the cast of mind that just says, well, I don't like Twitter or, man, I really like Twitter. And so therefore we're going to decide this. That's foreign to uh, any notion of judging that I know of. Um, we can't make an exception for Twitter. And <clears throat> I, 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 I'm not going to opine on it. <laughs> um, I, uh, this is from uh, Moira, a law student. 
Uh, I saw that you've done considerable work in the area of religious liberty. <clears throat> Yes. By the way, the judge and I know each other because we disagree about the, uh, those issues. That's not why we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw that you've done considerable work in religious liberty. Have you found working in this area of the First Amendment, uh, has this area of the First Amendment shaped uh, the way you perceive freedom of speech? So is there any connection in your thinking between uh, religious freedom and freedom of speech? Um, well, I mean, certainly the jurisprudence draw it makes connections between them and it solves some problems with, with speech, with the speech clause, uh, and other problems with the free exercise clause and they're, they're interrelated speech and religion are obviously interrelated, uh, concepts. Um, my, my work in religious liberty, I, I was very proud to do that work. I, I got to represent, uh, clients like Hobby Lobby stores, uh, in, in, um, in cases like that, and also, you know, religious schools and religious networks and that sort of thing. Um, I, I thought that was extremely important work because the religious freedom that we have, much like the, the freedom of speech that we have in this country, is something that is um, sort of, I don't know that I would say it's unusual, but it's an extraordinary and important feature of our freedom um, in the United States. I mean, it's just a very important part of our legal traditions. And I, th I think, and I'm not, I'm not forecasting the result of any particular case, of course, but it's obviously an important value in our constitutional system. Religious liberty is. Um, but by the same token, so I was a religious liberty lawyer, so I was, that's the direction that I was representing clients in, was fighting for their religious liberty rights. Um, now I'm a judge. So a case comes before me, um, does that, is someone, is someone going to claim, well, you're going to be predisposed to rule in favor of the religious claimant? And the answer is no. If I were predisposed to rule in favor of the religious claimant, then I'd have to recuse myself from the case. That's just basic ethics. Um, it, does it mean maybe I'm more comfortable with the precedents in that area? Yes, uh, maybe. Um, although, because your knowledge of them. Yeah, just know them. I just know them better. Yep. Now, uh, gee, I hope that means that I that I can you know work out the answer uh, more readily as a result of that. But um, but you you put on a different hat when you're a judge. I've had religious liberty cases where I've ruled against the claimant. Often they're prisoner cases. Um, I've had a few. I haven't actually had haven't had that many in the five years I've been on the court. But uh, I'm grateful for the work that I did in that area. Uh, mentioning religious liberty provoked all sorts of questions uh, about the Smith decision, uh, and uh, if you think it's uh, correctly decided. That's a precedent of the Supreme Court, isn't it? I think so. I think it is. <laughs> so remember what I said earlier about being an inferior court? I'm just trying to... <clears throat> I'm just trying to remember the pages of my book where I support Smith. I was going to cite those now, but I can't. I've got, I have your book. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this question puts the previous two together. Oh. Um, do you think instances of inferior courts subversion uh, of Supreme Court precedents, I, I, I'm filling in the blank here, such as in cases like Masterpiece Cake Shop, uh, religious liberty case, and other cases should result in any sort of discipline for those judges? I'm, <laughs> That's a, that's, that's, by, a, by, that's by Evan, the Notre Dame junior, by the way, not that's a law an, student. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, nobody likes to be reversed. Uh, and I was, by, by the way, a couple of weeks ago, I was reversed 5-4 by the Supreme Court. Um, and and I, I, I feel great about it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I really enjoyed reading the dissent. But um, <laughs> that possibly was written by a Notre Dame former Notre Dame law professor, but I digress. And um, uh, what was the question? Oh, um, <laughs> so, so of, yes, so yeah. no one, nobody wants, I mean, you, you're, nobody wants to be reversed and, no, and nobody wants to be some revved, uh, which is judge speak for summarily reversed without even having briefing an oral argument. You don't want that to happen. Uh, you, you, you want to be doing your best to apply the precedence of the Supreme Court. It's well known that in certain areas uh, of law, in certain eras, some circuits have been in the habit of being summarily reversed by the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, you don't want to be in that position. Um, so uh, that, I, that to me, that's discipline enough.
you, you prompted several questions of the same, <laughs> the same thing, which is explain why Professor Munoz is wrong. We can skip those. <laughs> No. Um, oh, this is a good one. Um, should judges go back to riding circuit? You have to explain what that is. And why or why not? Riding circuit. Yeah. Early, early in, the, in our nation's history, I mean, Supreme Court justices in particular had to go out and travel the, the muddy roads of early America and sit on circuit courts. Um, sometimes they had to try cases. I think... Uh, uh, the the justice who was impeached, now I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, um, uh, his name was impeached because of something that happened during one of the trials that he was conducting while on circuit uh, in early or early American history. Uh, <laughs> I, I look, I, I think we have the second largest caseload in the country. I don't. I I, uh, I work hard enough, so I don't. I, <laughs> I don't need to. Uh, I assume I, I assume the question means Supreme Court justice is not because I'm not sure I'm already even judge. better. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do Supreme Court should Supreme Court justices yeah. ride circuit? Yeah. Do I do I look like an idiot? Like I <laughs> like, like I would ask, answer that question. I it's, my immense respect for the Supreme Court prevents me from even venturing an answer. <laughs> that. It hasn't happened in, in, in centuries. So doubt it's coming back anytime soon. OK, this is a, a follow up uh, to your answer to another question. Uh, why shouldn't inferior courts rule, I'm sorry, why shouldn't inferior court judges based, uh, rule based on a proper understanding of the Constitution rather than Supreme Court precedent, assuming the judge sees a, co a conflict between the two? The Constitution doesn't say you have to, I'm, I'm assuming they mean you have to follow precedent, you have to <clears throat> take an oath in office to the Constitution. Um, the court can always just overrule you if it wants. So the question is, if you think the Supreme Court got it wrong, uh, uh, you take an oath in office to the Constitution, shouldn't you follow your oath and uphold the Constitution, not Supreme Court precedent? Well, um, uh, of course, no judge that I know of would ever do that, would ever take that, that position. So that's, that's it's some evidence that you shouldn't take that position, that nobody else would do it. It's not conclusive. But um, so I, I think there are ways of registering disagreement with Supreme Court precedent, that would be more productive than that, because as you say, that's going to result in an immediate summary reversal. Um, uh, concurrence uh, in a case, uh, I remember uh, before Justice Gorsuch was on the Supreme Court, he wrote a noteworthy concurrence in an immigration case criticizing a certain form of administrative deference, uh, court deference to administrative agencies. Uh, and that was his way of, I think it was a concurrence to an opinion that he wrote. So that was his way of registering discomfort with uh, a Supreme Court doctrine, but doing it in a way that was productive and not, I mean, you want to get along with your colleagues, and, and that includes the colleagues who can overrule you immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 you don't, it, it's sort of, I mean, you you're operating within a system of precedent, it's it it's true. I know that there are some people who say, "Well, but there's but precedent can't overcome your duty to, to uphold the Constitution." I understand that as a theoretical matter. I just don't think that has any practical significance in our system right now. Um, so, you want to do things that are productive, uh, in my view, uh, not not things that are needlessly antagonistic. I guess there are ways of of registering. Uh, your, I mean, we we on my court, people write separate concurrences all the time. And sometimes I do. And, and I, I read uh, concurrences from my fellow judges and uh, judges from other circuits with great interest. Um, takes a lot of work to do that. Um, but I, I think it's worthwhile to do it. You, you have more freedom in a concurrence? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because the concurrence is not, so a separate writing that's maybe concurring in the judgment yeah. uh, and saying, look, uh, precedent dictates this. Uh, however, I think that it's worth considering that some of this precedent may be wrong. You're 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 speaking to the Supreme Court. I mean, it's done, mm -hmm. um, and that's legitimate. I think that's perfectly legitimate. Yes, yeah. Yeah. like I said, different judges have different views on that. Some don't. Some don't like to do that. Um, others do it often. Um, I myself don't write too many separate concurrences, but I've done that. There's a number of questions, uh, and they're, uh, they're all basically asking the same thing about the nomination process, mm. judicial nomination process. And the, the basic question, is it broken? Does it work? Uh, and a, f a few questions asked if you could talk about your own process of going 
uh, your own experience of going through that process? Sure. Um, well, I mean, to answer the question of whether it's broken, uh, I, I would say this. If you compare the way that judges were confirmed, say, at the time that Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were confirmed to the Supreme Court, I believe that they had no opposition whatsoever or maybe one senator voted against them. Uh, that was in the 80s, early 80s, mid 80s. Um, and that 90s too, I mean, Ginsburg. And the 90s, right, that's right. And, and so today, look at what we have. It's obvious what we have. We have something very different. Um, I ask what has changed. I'm not sure what has changed. Um, I don't, I, I think, um, so there's been a shift in how the Senate and, and the larger public perceives these kind of things, these, these nomination hearings. They, th this has become also a, an issue with circuit. Uh, I've talked to circuit judges who were effectively waived through the Senate. Voice vote, unanimous, no problem. It's a circuit judge, you know. Um, and today, uh, you can look at the statistics on the, the amount of opposition that judges in my kind of cohort of judges face, which was, I thought, remarkable. Um, and uh, the, the fact that it's almost purely partisan is troubling. Um, so there's, I think there's lots of problems. I don't know that I'd say it's broken. Uh, my own nomination process was, um, I, 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 I would say lengthy, but I don't want to insult my colleagues who, at the, there was no filibuster in place for circuit nominees at the time I went through. So I have colleagues who languished for four years. Uh, so I don't want to say that my 18 months was lengthy. It seemed like 18 years, but it was only 18 months. Um, it's unpleasant, I found, to be the center of attention, uh, much like much like this current uh, issue where I'm the center of attention. Um, but I, I found that unpleasant because it, when, when, when things are about you, then it's very personal, whereas I prefer things to be about legal issues. That's, that's much easier to deal with. Um, one point that I found myself making often was that uh, in America, in the United States of America, when lawyers represent clients, it's not fair to impute everything the client thinks to the lawyer. So, so as to say, therefore, when you're a judge, we know what you're going to do. Uh, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's a healthy view. I think that's a view that's contradicted by, uh, by our own history, such as John Adams representing the, and getting acquitted some of the, the British soldiers who fired on citizens, um, and fired on colonists. Um, so it, it, it was important for me to make that point. Um, I didn't enjoy the hearings. I don't think the hearings are meaningful. I honestly, I don't. No insult to the senators, but I just don't think they're meaningful. <laughs> I think they involve a lot of speechifying. Um, I don't think they typically do not involve a real substantive discussion of judicial temperament, your approach to judging your views. I mean, it's difficult. You can't forecast your views on cases because that would be unfair to litigants. But I, I, I mean, I think you can talk substantively about constitutional doctrine or, le or federal legal doctrine. Um, I just don't, the, the nominate, the, the hearings at, at my time, just, they weren't that. Would it, uh, this, this is for me, um, I understand you couldn't talk about future litigation, but if the senators <clears throat> pressed you to say, look, uh, what about precedents? Uh, was this precedent rightly decided? And the senators say, uh, if they, as a, as a body, an institutional body said, we're not going to confirm anyone unless they actually answer our question. You guys are so evasive, <clears throat> you know, you, you won't say anything you know whether you agree or disagree with this precedent, and you just hide behind, oh, it might become, come up before the court. The senators pressed you to do that? Could, could nominees answer their questions without being unfair to future litigants? You know, I, I mean, it's a great question. I, I'm not sure the answer. I mean, what I've heard said is that if I express my um, disagreement with some precedent, then a litigant's going to come before me and know that I have favorite precedents and unfavorite precedents. Um, I do think it would be healthy if it were so clear a norm that no matter what my view of precedent is, I'm going to apply it fairly. That, that's what I'm going to do. Then sure, I could see some realm, some alternative universe where you have a reasonable discussion about 
you know, th this, this precedent here, sure, it's a precedent. I don't think the reasoning was very good. I think it could have been reasoned this way. I think the court should have considered this. However, when it comes down to it, it's a precedent of the court that I have to apply. Yes. Uh, it would be nice to live in a, um, a country uh, with a political system that could handle that. It seems that we don't. Uh, but I mean, I, don't, I, I wouldn't rule it out altogether. Of course, I'm not a senator. Um, and if that were the norm of the Senate, I guess we'd have to. The, the senators could change that norm if they really I have wanted no, to. I, yeah. I, I can see no reason why they, they, they would. Do uh, one more question on this. Do good women and men, do you think, not uh, let their names go forward to be nominated because of the confirmation process? You know, that's a great question. I don't know anyone personally, but it is easy for me to imagine that there are people who have said quietly, I appreciate that, but no thanks. Okay. And then I'm going to put a final question. I'm going to put together a number of questions from undergraduates. Um, why did you want to be a lawyer? Um, did you, uh, do you enjoy being a judge? Question said, minus the last two weeks, do you enjoy being a judge? And what would you, what advice would you give for uh, undergraduates thinking about going to law school uh, and law students who are thinking about uh, a career in the law? Good. Um, so again, I'm the wrong person to ask for career advice. Uh, went to law school because I couldn't get a job. Um, and I gave it a six months because I don't come from a family of lawyers. Um, there's nobody in my family who's a lawyer. Uh, and I didn't know what to expect in law school. Um, I, I didn't know if it was gonna be like tax accounting school or something, you know, something really dry. I found it far more interesting and philosophically engaging than I had anticipated. And I studied, I studied in a mixed jurisdiction, meaning I, I took classes in civilian law, which is European and law and it's very code based and it's very rigorous and and so it's a little bit different than than uh, other law schools but i gave it 6 months to see if this is something i wanted to do and i did it was very obvious to me that i enjoyed it i enjoyed the back and forth i enjoyed the sort of intellectual rigor of it um so my advice uh is um my advice to you is not everybody needs to go to law school and i i tell my children this too uh, we, there are lots of things to do with your life that are not law. Um, we don't need people going into law who are not really suited to be lawyers, but who might be suited to be a scientist or an engineer or a physician or, or an accountant or whatever, a farmer. Um, the, uh, we don't, we, 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 we don't, the law shouldn't be a default. So you should ask yourself, you should inform yourself, talk to law professors, talk to students who are in law school and ask yourself, am I, do I think that I am suited to be a lawyer? Being a lawyer, just like, look, I, I, I wouldn't be a very good physician. I, I don't like blood and, you know, <laughs> uh, I just, I would not be good at that. I like to work with ideas and, 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 and I, I love to write. Um, what was it? There was a third part of that question. Uh, 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 do you enjoy being a judge? Oh, and your advice to um, the current law students uh, on entering the legal profession? Yeah, um, I yes, I enjoy being a judge. Uh, I'm very, I'm blessed beyond measure uh, to be a judge because the kind of work I do as a judge is similar to the kind of work I did as a lawyer. I did a lot of appellate work, and so I knew how the ap appeals courts work. I clerked for the court I sit on, so I enjoyed immensely. I enjoy my colleagues uh, of all political stripes. Uh, I enjoy, they keep me honest. Um, they, um, they're, they're, they have very strong opinions and they will, they will tell me if I'm wrong. And I appreciate that. Um, even when they're wrong about that, but, um, so I enjoy it immensely and I'm, I'm grateful to God beyond measure. Uh, I'm the last person in the world who ever expected to be a judge in terms of law students, and entering the legal, if you're a law student and you're thinking about what to do with your law degree, I encourage you to explore as many possibilities as you can. I was, um, I did well in law school and the track was, was, was sort of set for me. Well, you go clerk and you go to a big firm and, you know, and, and, and all that. And that's fine for some people, but it wasn't fine for me. Um, I found a, a, a niche in government practice that was much more congenial to me. Um, and I enjoyed dealing with the sort of public issues that were involved in government practice. I think I would have been just as happy, say, if I had been a, a federal public defender, 
um, because, uh, or I, I, in the U.S. Attorney's Office or in a District Attorney's Office, just because not only the issues seem more vital to me than tax issues, um, but also you got to hone the craft of being a lawyer much more immediately than you did in other settings. In other words, one of my professors said, you had to stand up on your hind legs immediately and deliver an argument. It's like, you'll never forget when you first have to stand up in court and say, your honor, I, my client should prevail for the following three reasons. And you actually have to say them. Um, and you may think reason three is probably not going to win, but you need to make it because it's a colorable argument and you need to, you need to do that. Um, I would also encourage you, I, I sort of was more the law review kind of reading and writing kind of guy. So I went the appellate route. I do wish I, I, I would have been a, a more well-rounded lawyer had I done more trial work uh, and, and been willing to sort of, you know, get down in the, in the dirt and just get, do, do trials. Um, I think that's a very valuable thing to do. And I tell people that who are looking for clerkships, have you considered clerking for a district judge? Uh, uh, because you get to see how a trial works and, there, and get some practical knowledge that, frankly, I, I didn't develop. Okay. Uh, before we uh, thank Judge Duncan, let me thank <clears throat> you uh, for coming and uh, doing an event how an event like this should be done. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank and you. let's thank Judge Duncan.